when is it time to start discussing letting go of Schneider? This was more, in my opinion, a decision to be made for Jody last offseason, in my opinion. And it is one of those points of data that I always say, Thomas, on this. I don't know is what I tend to come to this. And what I mean by that is that no general managers up until the start of this year, no general managers in the sport, save one or two, have a head coach who can overrule them, who has more power than they have to dictate things. And even if that coach isn't swinging that gavel over and over again, but swinging it at precipitous moments, like, you know, making a trade for a safety for two first round picks and a third, then he's coming in and, and causing harm in how that general manager can do his job. I get, I'm not saying I know this to be the case. What I'm saying is I don't know. And so that this had to be then on the back of that committee that came together last off season to discuss parting with Coach Carroll to then also bringing Schneider into that consideration of where he stood. And I have read into it based on the fact Schneider wasn't in that mode that that committee group looked at it and they saw that this was more of Carroll at the forefront in these problems, that John's not had the opportunity to run this full set go. And so that's the first important part of this, Thomas, because the second part of this comes into play on, yes, he's now responsible. And he is now completely on his back. And I don't think you fully just reset the clock here. I don't say that, right? But what I do say is that it's a little bit like Carol back two years ago when he said, hey, we've we've been arrogant in our ways. We've got to change our ways. We're, we're going to go over and we're going to run the Rams offense. We're going to run the cover two shell Vic Fangio stuff. Let's fly. We're changing our ways. We've figured it out. We've understood. And and it would be like if that didn't, if that failed in that first year going, oh, Carol, all these years of bad defense, and we just the first year of putting all these new schemes into play, right? I think you got to be kind of similar with Schneider, where it's probably a two-year process here. It's probably through next off season that you make a determination like that because he hasn't had that chance to fully run and go. This is me kind of, again, I am doing some logical deduction here that may not be where it is, Thomas. And if it's in the place that the committee didn't just really keep that into account, John's really been screwing the pooch these whole years. He's really the kind of the bad guy. Okay, then he should be gone, all right? Definitely there. If it's just wholly all on him on all these choices, then I'm, I'm completely with that. But if it is as I, I'm suspecting a bit, I think more of that came into where they understood you've not been able to run your job in the way that most general managers are able to run. And therefore, we've got to give you a little bit more time. It doesn't mean that he may not be the wrong guy here at this point, but it does mean just in, in the name of giving the fair shake thing, if you're going to go down that line of it, I think that that's what you got to do here. I think that if you're going to make that choice, you should have made it this offseason if he was that close to the door. Let's say, let's put it that way. Addis the Gamer says, I think John needs to be taking the blame here too. John needs to get the blame here. John took this offseason where he was running full and free. John had an opportunity now to where he could have said, okay, well, you know, Coach Carroll through these years said, look, offensive line's not as important as my cherished defense. Take care of my cherished defense, John. Make that your centerpiece, John. Okay, now you got your first offseason. And and what do you choose to do with it? You have you have knuckleheads like me out here, morons like me, guys that don't know football anywhere at the level you know it, out here begging you for years to do this thing you don't do and now you've got the all the right and road to go do it and instead you go back and draft let's say another defensive tackle in the first round after you you just spent 70 and a half million on one guy that you decided to kick out to edge and then 21 more million on this guy and uh you go okay, okay. you wait to the third round to finally take a guy and i think he'll be a, still a pretty good player long term but you're you're not re, you're not you're doing that bare minimum you're going where's the line at What's the bare minimum I got to do? Okay, there, I'm done. And again, he did nothing but establish the same principles he's established here as far as his philosophy on the offensive line the past off few off seasons. I'll allocate one really good draft pick to it. I'll try to go to find something in the back end of the draft, which we all know is not likely to be found anything in there. I'm going to go find that one veteran slash he decided to take, he decided, he decided to go double down twice on this one. So he thought, okay, you know, I'm going bad. I got the one elder offensive lineman on his last legs that I try to carve out one final season from in a one-year $3 million deal, one-year $4 million deal. So you know you know what will fix that is instead of doing that with just one guy, let me do it with two guys because I'll do it with George Fant too. And so you basically just applied your same kind of philosophy on that side of the ball and that line again this offseason. And I... I think people are going to, I'm not in the boat of calling for a job, but I do think I understand where people are coming from, where you just, you failed to address this thing. You had high opportunity to, and instead you went on, and it's, it, what makes it worse is you went on radio with the soundbite saying guards are kind of overdrafted and overpaid. <laughs> John, <laughs> you know, read the room, see where the wind's blowing. And it's, it's not that you're wrong necessarily to say, well, they're overdrafted and overpaid, but it is the price is the price, right? You can't you can't walk into high end market on Beverly Hills and see all this and go, yeah, but I just I don't think the leather's that good, so I just want to pay like a fourth the price. I know we're not gonna do that. I'm like, okay, well, I'm going down to the mall down the store then. Oh, you pay for what you get. I think that the blame is rightfully placed on his shoulders here, as we've seen this offensive line in countless games almost single handedly take down the whole ship with it. And um, you've had time to learn this lesson. It's not a new thing 
just this year. It's not a new thing just last year. There's the, the, the 10 years of data that, you know, I, I just dropped a video three weeks ago with neglect on the thumbnail title for a reason. It's 10 years of neglect. I'm not doing this calling for, for heads. I'm not doing this to say, John, got to go. What I'm doing is saying, John, time, time for an over course correction. I don't effing give a damn. Very frustrating to see. Mickle Cam, thank you for the $10 donation, Mickle Cam. He says, I think I've seen enough of this offensive line. We've got one quality starter and four mediocre backups. Schneider cannot be the GM after 2025 if he doesn't fix the offensive line. Grubb needs to do better. We've become the Browns. I agree. At least the Browns know how to invest in an offensive line. They, their quarterback lacks handies, but they know how to build an offensive line. And yeah, I think that's pretty accurately what I see from the same thing. And as I say that, I do think you give him the two years, but I've got to say, I mean, if I walk through an offseason of another Lake and Tomlinson clone brought in to be our left guard next year, and I got to bring and another center that's going, they're going to pay $3 million to who's He's got 150 games started by five teams in six years. Please. I mean, how do you excuse it at that point? How do you not at that point have the fan base completely at your throat? I'm trying to I'm trying to hold him back here, John. I'm the guy back there trying to arms out, hold him. Stop, guys. Just stop. No, you don't understand. Hold on. Just stop. No, you don't, guys. You just trust the process. Sanchez, thank you for another $2 donation. He says, guards are overpaid. Well... You get what you pay for. That's it. And you can lament it. You get mad at it. You, you, you cannot understand it as a general manager. Why is a guard this offseason getting paid $20 million a year? How could you do that? He's not even that good. Or he's good, but he's not that. He's not great. And you go, well, I don't understand it either, man. Um, I think some of it's just there's a there is a desperation mode at play with these teams, John. And the alternative is that your line looks like yours. The alternative is if I don't pay this guy, my whole offense comes to a dead standstill. So I guess they go, it's worse than the alternative. And you get mad at the prices, but the prices aren't changing and they're not going down anytime soon. And utilizing this just one hallway of we're only going to draft them. We're just going to draft them. We're just going to draft them. It's not going to work. You got to do a little more than that, especially the shape it's in. If some of this development actually come a little bit more forward over the past couple of years, it'd be different, but it's not. So stuck is as stuck does. He says, hi, Brandon. Great show. They need to be aggressive on getting a proper offensive line build. If he doesn't build one, John Schneider needs to be put on the hot seat. Britt is the only lineman to get a second contract. There we go. So you got Justin Britt, uh, the only offensive lineman for your Seahawks to get that second contract. I think he was, I want to say drafted about 2014. So that's the last guy to be get that second contract. And even in the case of a guy like Britt, Bryce, who is a quote unquote success story, which look, he is, he got the, got the second contract with you. It isn't a pure raw success story, right? Because he starts out as a tackle. Eh, it's not really a tackle. Okay. Let's move him into guard. Eh, not really a guard. All right. Let's go, let's go center, center. Eh, kind of works in there at center. And so it was even as that success story, you still, you didn't see it right and proper and how you scouted it and picked it. You didn't exactly develop it right. And it took him failing at two positions before you finally got to the third. And uh, so it's, it still is almost a representation of almost as much of a failure as a success, I would say, especially given the fact that Bryce, once you gave him that second contract, he didn't give you the same level of performance of that one final year, that one final year that gave you the performance to deserve that next contract. But um, I, I'm, this is a bit at the heart of our discussion today on this Bryce and I think it's absolutely true. It, I don't know I don't even need to go through all of next season. If our offseason approach by the time we get into June and we're landing in June and we're like, okay, all money spent, no more draft picks, we're set, baby. And I'm looking out there and you've done a third round pick for a left guard and you've signed a uh, example player A who's going to have a $3 million deal and he's 32 years old and he's had two torn ACLs and and a torn pec. And you're like, but one more year, man, one more year he's got. I'm telling you, licking the bottom of a can for the last couple of drops. But Bryce, thank you for the $10 donation, brother. I appreciate you on that. And I I would say it's it's the question I will get asked. You will get asked. Um, any person doing any of this kind of content stuff's gonna be asked as we go into the future of this team. So what does the team need to do? How do we get this ship righted? And it does not it does not get to terribly complicated for me on this one. I, I do believe in what the words of like what Harbaugh said this preseason. I thought it was a great point. No one's pushed back on it. And that is that offensive line remains the only position that's not relying on anybody else on the field. Quarterback, relying on the offensive line. Receiver, relying on the offensive line and the quarterback running back at the very least relying on the offensive line you know we can we can play this game all the way on defensive line i need my guys to cover my my cover guys i need my defensive line to get home it all interconnects to where somebody needs somebody else to do their job offensive line does their job pure on their own you push your man back you keep your quarterback protected or you don't it's just that damn simple so time to step up to the plate i'm not calling for jobs i'm not doing any of that i'm going over the more i but i do not think any of us are being emotional here at this prime price getting this close into john schneider's face 
<laughs> John, listen to me. Build the offensive line. Why I hammer this so hard is that there are complicated things that are indistinguishable and hard to get edges on in football. Hard to see this edge, hard to see that edge, hard to see where the evolution of the sport goes here to prevent you from seeing up ahead on that line and being ready to anticipate it, like pre-snap motion or receivers that suddenly need to turn into yak monsters. You know, these type of things that are kind of harder to see. Investment in the offensive line is timeless, baby. It's a Rolex, okay? It's a Rolex. So let's wind the watch. Let's go to Switzerland. All right. Put on your silly hat. Grab your wooden shoes.